This is the introduction to your general chemistry laboratory on compound stoichiometry, in which we'll do two experiments. One is determining the formula of an oxide, and another is determining the hydrate number of a hydrate. And so we're going to go through the background chemistry first, and then the experimental details. So the idea of background of compound stoichiometry really revolves on one central premise. The ratio of atoms in a compound formula equals the ratio of the moles of those elements in the compound. So for example, an S2F molecule, disulfur, disulfur decafluor decafluoride molecule, has two sulfur atoms for every 10 fluorine atoms. A bulk sample of that compound will have two moles of sulfur for 10 moles of fluorine. So we have a connection between atoms and moles, and therefore a connection between moles and the formula of the compound. So given that, that we have that connection, why should you care? The reason is that molecules and atoms are too small to see, so it's really hard or almost impossible, or actually impossible, to make uh, measurements on individual atoms inside molecules because they're just too small and too hard to measure. So what we do is we figure out the formula of compounds by measuring the moles of the elements present in a bulk sample and then comparing the moles of our sample. So in this particular case, we would find that there are five moles of fluorine for each mole of sulfur, and that would help us figure out that compound formula. And so that's the key. The key is the moles of the elements get us to the formula of the compound, because we can't look at individual atoms because they're too small. OK, so here's an example. Um, we do a reaction. And we react 2.253 grams of manganese, that's a metal in the periodic table, and that produces, we react it with, with the element sulfur, and manganese is MN, and that produces 4.883 grams of a compound. And we want to know what's the formula of that compound. And so what we do is we say, the first thing we do is we say, okay, well, we have 2.253 grams of manganese, and what we'll do is we'll convert that to moles. And we use the molar mass of manganese from the periodic table to do that. And the molar mass of manganese is 54.94 grams. And when you divide that out, notice grams cancels and you're left with moles. And you end up with 0 0.0410 moles of manganese. Then what you do is you have to figure out how much sulfur there is. The grams of sulfur is how much mass was added. We start with 2.253 grams of manganese. We reacted it with sulfur, so sulfur was added, and we ended up at 4.883 grams. So the grams of sulfur is 4.883 grams minus the initial amount of manganese, 2.253 grams. And so that equals 2.630 grams of sulfur. And then we can take the 2.63 grams of sulfur and figure out how many moles it is. And to do that, we use its molar mass, one mole of sulfur, over 32.07 grams. That's from the periodic table. So again, grams cancels. And that gives us 0 0.0820 moles of sulfur. And then we compare moles of manganese and sulfur. And so we have 0 0.0820 moles of sulfur for every 0 0.0410 moles of manganese, which means there's two sulfurs for each manganese. So therefore, the formula is MN, MNS2. So that's determining formula. And so your experiment for determining an oxide formula works this same way. For determining a hydration, a hydration number, the idea is that there are compounds that have water molecules attached to an ionic compound. So an example would be copper sulfate hex pentahydrate, where for every copper sulfate unit, there's five water molecules that are part of that solid state uh, structure. They're part of the compound. They're not wet. It's not wet. It's not damp. Those are part of it. And so we want to do an experiment where we find that number for a different compound. And so you'll be doing this in lab with a compound, but we'll do an example here to show you how the, how the uh, experiment works and how the calculations work. Here we start with 
32.86 grams of cobalt chloride hydrate. So there's some number, N number of water molecules attached. And you heat that, and when you heat it, you, you essentially remove all the water. When it's done, you have 17.93 grams of that. And so what we do is we want to find out the formula of that hydrate and thereby figure out the number of water molecules per cobalt chloride. So what we need to do is we need to find the number of moles of water and the number of moles and divide that by the number of moles of cobalt chloride without any water. The cobalt chloride without any water is what we end up with. We end up with 17.93 grams of that. So let's figure that out first. 17.93 grams of cobalt chloride times one mole over the molar mass of cobalt chloride. That's 129.84 grams. That gives us 0 0.1381 grams of co I mean, sorry, moles of cobalt chloride. So then we need to figure out how many moles of water. But to do that, we need to know the mass of the water. The mass of the water is how much we lost. We start with 32.86 grams. We heated it. We ended up with 17.93 grams. That loss is the water that left. So the grams of water equals 32.86 grams minus 17.93 grams. And so we lost 14.93 grams of water. 14.93 grams of water times one mole over 18.02 grams, that's the molar mass of water, gives us the moles of water, which is 0 0.8288 moles of water. So that's how many moles of water we lost. So N is equal to the moles of water per mole of cobalt chloride, so it's equal to 0 0.8288 moles of water over 0 0.1381 moles of cobalt chloride. That was what we had here. And that, when you divide, is 6. So our formula of our initial hydrate was COCl2 dot, the dot means borders of hydration, 6H2O. And so that's how that works, and that's what you'll be doing in lab with a different uh, compound to figure out its hydration number. All right, so now let's talk about the experimental. The experimental for this lab is actually pretty simple. Everything is going to be done by heating samples and reacting them. In one case to combine with oxygen, in another case to, to uh, remove water. And so what you do is you clean, dry, and weigh a, a crucible, and your lab directions tell you how to do that. This is a crucible here. It's got a cover and a crucible there. And the idea is you put that on an iron ring that has what's called a clay triangle. And so that clay triangle is a good insulator, so it doesn't heat up really fast, and it, and it um, is good to snugly hit, snug, snugly hold the, uh, the crucible. Crucibles are pretty expensive, and they're pretty fragile, so be careful with them. You'll be lifting them with your tongs. So what you do is you clean, um, dry, and weigh the crucible, and so you'll know the weight of the crucible and its cover. Then you put stuff in the crucible, and you heat it up really hot for a while, and that's when the reaction happens. And then you let it cool, and you reweigh it. And the mass difference between before and after is what you're looking for. That's the kind of experimental information we were just using in our mathematical examples. A couple of uh, hints and tips for this. Don't weigh hot, hot objects. When you weigh hot objects, the weight is not, uh, the mass that you get is not accurate because it makes air currents. And plus, it's just, it's not good for you because you're going to be touching hot objects. Let the crucible cool in the clay triangle. So you're going to heat this up in the clay triangle. Let it cool there. Don't take it off and put it on the bench top because if you put it on the bench top, it'll crack. And if it cracks, it's broken, and that costs us money, and you have to start over. Leave the cover slightly ajar, as we show here, when you're doing the reaction because that will let water to evaporate to escape if it's evaporating. It'll also let oxygen in in the air if you're reacting with oxygen. But So be careful about that um, when you're doing it so it doesn't fall all the way off. Uh, we'll show you this in a picture a minute ago, um, but it, the directions in the lab tell you to heat gently at first and then, and then more vigorously. A gentle flame is one that uses very little air, and it's fairly wobbly and doesn't have a bright blue cone. Heating strongly means with a very hot flame. A very hot flame is one that uses a lot of air, and the flame has a bright blue cone, and it makes a cool ripping sound. Just like that. 
So let's look at a little video of how to use a Bunsen burner. So a Bunsen burner has um, two, really two controls. This is the tube that has the gas. You turn the valve on at the, at the source for the gas all the way. You don't control how much gas comes in over on the wall. You control the gas by this needle valve on the bottom. So you spin it in that direction to let more gas in. You spin it in that direction to let less gas in. When you let more gas in, the flame will get bigger. When you let less gas in, the flame will get smaller. You control the air, the air goes in, the air that the gas is reacting with goes in these little holes here. And you control how much of that there is by letting more or less air in. If you go in that direction, it lets less air in. If you go in that direction, it lets more air in. And so you control the air by twisting the top here. And that controls, the air controls how hot the flame is. So let's look at a little video of this. So we have a Bunsen burner here. And what happens is, twisting there is controlling how much air. So you start out with it twisted all the way um, over and then just a little bit, just laying, laying a little bit of oxygen in. And then you open up the, you close the valve most of the way and just open it up a little bit on the bottom. So there's just a little bit of air and a little bit of gas coming out. You use this striker. Oh, you, this is uh, the, the control at the wall. You turn that on all the way. Then use the striker to start the flame. You then control the flame by letting more or less oxygen in. So we're letting more oxygen as we're spinning in this direction, and notice the flame now is starting to have that cone there, which means it's hotter. This makes the flame bigger or smaller. So this, I'm going to pause this a second, this is actually a fairly hot flame because it's got this bright blue cone. This flame here is not very hot. Well, it's still pretty hot. That flame's not very hot, and you can tell because it's got this yellow tip here. You don't want a lot of that because it'll put soot on your, uh, on your crucible. But basically, a flame that's got no yellow cone and is pretty wobbly, that's a relatively cool flame. It's still hot, of course, but it's not nearly as hot. And so that's our uh, experiment. Uh, be sure to read the directions and listen to uh, the details your lab instructor gives you, but that gives you an initial introduction to it.